today. So I do want to make this useful for you guys. I don't want to sit here and lecture you for an hour and a half. So it is super interactive. I've, I've had um, some questions already, which I'm going to go through, but don't hesitate to interrupt me. I like, I'm quite happy with interruptions. Um, if I give you a brief overview of what I support, so like Herb said, I, I look after Australia, New Zealand and Fiji. We've got about New Zealand and Fiji, which are my favourite places to support because I get to do a, a little bit of travel through some nicer places, some, some nice places. Um, <clears throat> I support everything that government, academia um, or corporate uses with regards to the databases that are um, so what Clarivate does is they have a, a very comprehensive indexed database of journal and literature content, in not only uh, covering everything that's in the literature, but also making connections between those journal articles. So every time an article cites an article, we make that connection. And so there's millions and millions of articles that we index, including everything on it, which are authors, title, abstract, institutions, acknowledgements, all that sort of thing, but we also make billions and billions of connections between those art articles which we exploit in our platforms. Um, we also have a patent database which is probably less of interest to you guys as well as a clinical trial database which again is probably less useful to you guys. We also um, acquired Publons a couple of years ago which is a peer review database. We have a number of other databases which we build platforms off of the top of and I support all those across government and academia. Um, <clears throat> if you were involved in the ERA process at all last year, we obviously provided the data for that process and I was very heavily involved in that. Um, so we work with the ARC. I was actually at the ARC yesterday morning, so I was in Canberra yesterday. Um, also in the Chief Scientist Office, the Chief Scientist uses our data as well as state governments. So Chief Scientist Offices in state governments will use our data as well, so I, w I work with them very closely. Um, and, and basically uh, anyone who wants to use our data, I'm supporting across Australia and New Zealand. Good, so our main platforms and the things I'm going to talk about today, and hopefully you already have some sort of an understanding of these ones. Web of Science is our discovery platform, so it's a simple search engine. Um, it basically allows you to run a search, so if I wanted to search everything that has come out of IPPE um, at the Australian Catholic University, if you guys are bylining yourselves well, <laughs> Um, on publications. This should uh, simply search out everything there. You don't have to search by address, you don't have to search by an entire organisation, you can search by anything that we index across all articles. So you can run a topic search which is searching for words in the title, abstract or keywords. You can search for an author name, you can filter by or search by the year published. You can search by funding agencies or grant numbers that are acknowledged in the acknowledgement section and so on and so forth. So you can really construct some nice searches uh, and refined searches if that's what you want to do. Um, I will also say you can throw a list of DOIs in if you have a, a nice list of DOIs and Karen before the session was nice enough to send me something that one of your wonderful librarians has produced which is everything that's come out of um, the IPPE um, since, do you have a, uh, do you say IPPE or do you say, yeah, yeah okay. Um, so everything that's come out of IPPE since 2005, Stephanie McGlinchey um, based in Victoria has a lovely um, data set there which we can use to search out because we index DOIs or PubMed IDs on documents as well, we can simply construct a Boolean search around them by putting PubMed IDs and ORs between each of them to, to search that out. So that's an idea of how you would use that. If I search this, this is refining by everything that's come out of Australian Catholic University. Organisation enhanced is something that we do and I manage locally for all local universities and institutes across Australia and New Zealand. So you will know, and as I will know, as most people will know, people byline themselves in weird and wonderful ways when they're affiliated with an organisation. You guys will be using IPPE at Australian Catholic University North Sydney, hopefully. Um, there will be other people at Australian Catholic University using very, very different bylines to that. We take all those different variants of bylines and roll them up into a single organisation to um, construct that search. So if I simply just use that line to search, that's going to pull out every single document that someone at the Australian Catholic University has produced. Can we create one of those for ourselves for IPPE? Ah, very good question. Yeah, so uh, yes, yes, we can talk about doing that afterwards. <laughs> yes, we can. Um, so very good point. If I do that and then simply refine by another line where someone has used 
the, the um, acronym IPPE or Institute of Positive Psychology and Education, I can do that and search that out and that's actually going to pull out a number of documents that is, is running, I'm running that search. Given that you guys are probably bylining yourself pretty well normally, that's pulled out. 345 documents and all of them are since 2014 because as I understand the Institute only moved into Australian Catholic University in 2014 so if you look at that there's about 100 or uh, between 50 and 100 odd documents a year coming out of the school where the byline states that if you're not stating that in your byline we're missing those documents in that search okay um, the other way of pulling that out if you wanted to uh, is is to run that PubMed ID search. So if I take these, and I'm sure Stephanie would be happy to to um, to f uh, share this with you, I can construct a lovely Boolean search around these PubMed IDs as well, and just say or between each one of them, and search them out to get a, a nice comprehensive overview of of everything out of. So yeah. Ah. ah, very good. So we won't have that in our system because we obviously don't index the Orion number. We do index DOI, so this won't be... I'm sure that column... Yeah, it's Research Master ID. Ah, is that different to the PubMed ID? Have you, you've created your own... Um, I'm not sure. Fair. Okay, all right. All right, let's sort these in any case. So a lot of these don't yet have a DOI, so it's the database that Stephanie has sent on here, um, there's 99 documents or 98 documents before there that don't have a DOI and that might simply because they're not digital yet. So DOI is a digital object identifier, so if it's not online it won't yet have a digital object identifier or maybe just simply because Stephanie's database isn't as comprehensive as she would like it to be, but the same idea we can search that and use DOIs because that is something that we um, index across documents and we can search out those documents given that those DOIs in the database are correct. I think the logic of what we were looking at probably is that we're best off using ORCID ID. So uh, uh, we, can, we can set up a list of ORCID IDs and what we'll probably want to do is create Great. an organization based on ORCID ID. Great, okay, let's, and let, let's, let's do that then. Let's do, let's do it um, Herb's way. So I'm actually going to move into, so basic search is, is fine if your search is relatively basic. If you want to do something a little bit longer and a little bit more um, advanced or a little bit more uh, unique, um, advanced search allows you to have thousands and thousands of Boolean operators within the one search. So we can do advanced search and you can also open up this window. It's just a little bit easier to see if you do have a really long search string. So in this case, if I'm searching DOIs, the, the Boolean field tag is DO which is DO equals open bracket and control V, I'll copy those DOIs in, get rid of the last OR because obviously we don't want that in our search and close that bracket off and that will search out those, those DOIs okay, in our database. If I wanted to use ORCID IDs, luckily enough, so there's 519 of those DOIs which I think there was about 600 odd, so 519 actually match up with something in our database there. There might be DOIs in there that we don't index and so they're, they're not coming up in that search string or alternately the DOI just doesn't match our DOI so for some reason one of the databases is wrong there. Um, ORCID's really good and what was really nice of uh, Karen before the session she sent me, uh, sorry, what am I doing? She sent me a list of the people. Does everyone have an ORCID ID? Mm. Pretty good. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. So this is a list of you guys, I guess, and your ORCID IDs, we can use this as well. So as long as you've matched documents to your ORCID ID, you can search your own ORCID ID out very easily and get a full comprehensive list of those publications along with all that. Um, information or we can do the whole faculty if we want or the whole division. So we can throw that in and I'm just going to go back to advanced search here and rather than using 
uh, DOI now, I'm using an ORCID identifier, which is a, or, or an author identifier, which is an ORCID. You can also use Researcher ID. It's another one that our company maintains, which has recently been rolled into Publons ID. That's another story. But author identifier is AI. So if I turn to this and say AI equals and do exactly the same thing, this is actually going to pull out all the documents that have been matched to one of these ORCID IDs. Does that make sense, what I'm doing there? Fabulous, and we can search that out and create a division report that way. So there's 1,280 documents that have been matched to that. Do note, if this isn't necessarily restricted to ACU, if you guys have produced documents at other institutions and then moved to ACU and you have them attached to your ORCID ID, they're also appearing under this search string, right? Um, if you wanted to restrict to anything produced at ACU, you would simply add another line to that search and say, and organisation enhanced Australian Catholic University, right? So that's that, and we can now click on that. One of Herb's papers will pull that open and you can start to see what we index across an entire paper. So title, authors, um, anyone who has a researcher or ORCID ID, this one's been attached to Philip Parker's. Doesn't look like Herb's added this document to his ORCID ID yet because we haven't indexed that. But is Philip in the room? Is Philip also somewhere here? Hello Philip, how are you going? Good work, because your ORCID ID picked this document up. Um, <laughs> um, and if you scroll down, you start to see all the journal information. Obviously, journal impact factors are all ours and that sort of thing. We can go into that data when we start answering these questions. You can start to get information on the journal, the keywords, the address lines and the affiliations there. This document also would have come up under my Institute for Positive um, Psychology and Education Research simply because whoever bylined this did a good job of bylining the institute as well, okay? Um, good, fine. If I go back to those search results, there's a whole bunch of other, an array of other things that you want to do in here which I don't want to touch on um, unless they come up in the questions. You can create a lovely citation report on your individual self or a group of people like I've just done with ORCID IDs. You've got 12,000 odd documents, 1,200 odd documents, my apologies, but they've been cited a total of 141,000 times by 80,000 odd unique documents. You can look at that across time when they've been cited. Um, someone's ORCID ID has documents back to 19, 68? Is that reasonable to assume? <laughs> Is that? <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. If we, if, if we wanted to click through, that's very good. I, I, didn't, I shouldn't have called you out, Herba. My apologies. Um, this link will obviously take you through to the one generation forward of citing documents. So those 80,000 documents, if you so please. You can also scroll down here and have a look at the documents that are being cited most often and get a breakdown of all that information there. You can extract this data out into an Excel file if you want. That is simply, that is very simple bibliometric information. It's nothing too advanced there. Um, that's a simple citation report. If I jump back to search results again, you can also analyse these results and break them down and you can do this with any set of results. So if you did want to jump one citation generation forward and click on that 80,000 documents and start to look at the countries of the world that were citing your to, to show some sort of global impact, you could do that. Here I'm just going to analyse results out of the 1,200 odd documents and you can get a nice little um, diagram of what areas of, of, of what, what, what web of science categories they've been published in, um, which organisations are producing them. Um, so yeah, Western Sydney's biggest because this institute was part of Western Sydney, as I understand, before it became part of ACU. Um, obviously, there's other institutions falling on these papers, so these are your biggest collaborators, you know, outside of the institution, if you like. If, if you want to look at more institutions, you can do that. You can see 20, up to 25 in the visualisation. The tree map is not my favourite type of visualisation. I think I find executive types like this, so if you do like this, I think you might be an executive type. You can also look at a bar graph. If you're not happy with either of them, you can extract this data at, a, um, at this level as well and visualise it however you like in an Excel spreadsheet, okay? Um, so that's any, any search can have that performed on and, and you can do that um, on any given search. I wanted to go a step forward and start to look at um, some of these questions, which most of them will be answered in Insights, which is our bibliometric analysis tool. So I'm going to do that, Bef which across the top is this. Is everyone familiar with Web of Science and Insights? Is, yeah, is Insights something that people are using regularly or not so much anymore? Am I starting at a very beginner level with Insights? Yes? 
<laughs> okay, okay. Some well, let's. Are using it a lot, and some people. <laughs> So I don't want to spend too much time in our discovery engine, but that is Web of Science, okay? It's a discovery tool for science literature. If you're wanting to construct a really nice topic search, I encourage you to do it and maybe create an alert around it so you get an email um, every time something new pops up in your area. So notice any search. If I wanted to create an alert around this and have an email sent to me every time someone tags one of these documents to their ORCID ID, I could kind of professionally stalk you guys, if that makes sense. It's a really nice search engine for that sort of thing. Yes, yes, there is an RSS link. Very good question. I'm um, sorry, back, 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 back. If you create this alert down the bottom, you'll find the RSS feed will be available after creating the alert. So, yes. So, we can set up a, 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 an alert that uh, sends out to all our people uh, every periodic uh, uh, time. Anything that any of us uh, cite, uh, any uh, publish, any new publications. Correct. Yep. Okay. So if you if you set up an alert around IPPE, like I did my first search, yep. IPPE, as long as someone's bylining that yep. uh, when they're publishing, or yes. We, can we set up an, uh, one using our ORCID ID? Yeah, you can set yeah. like I've just done here. Yeah. So I can actually do this for you if you like, Herb. I can throw your email address in here and send you an alert every time someone adds this. So you, I encourage you to get back to your desk and and set this up for yourself. It doesn't have to be a daily alert. If you don't want a daily annoying email, you can set that up monthly and just kind of keep an eye on what people are doing every month okay. if Good. you like. So it's yeah, really cool. And the RSS feed, I hope that I hope that's useful for. Good. So that's that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time in there. Now I'm going to talk about kind of bibliometrics and, and I'm going to start at what is a um, a, a kind of a, a basic level. I did have from Rhonda, Professor Rhonda. Is that that's our boss. Sorry? That's no, no. our boss. That's she, and boss. she's not in the room. I don't know whether I should... No, no, no <laughs> that's actually my list. Oh, is it? Okay. So that's okay. Okay, so there was a question in here just about our different indexes, which I might cover before I move on. We do have, obviously, a criteria. This isn't everything ever published on the internet, right? We have a criteria before we index things, um, and it does need to be... Uh, this is everything that ACU subscribes to, so everything you guys have access to. These are our three main indexes, and we choose and map journals to these indexes, and we have a very strict criteria before we choose a journal to be indexed within our database. These things include things like timeliness of publication, uh, transparent peer review and editorial process, um, an international citation impact, and things like that, okay? You'll know as an academic, I know as an academic that I'm getting a lot of emails from what are definitely or probably predatory journals, and we try to exclude any of that sort of stuff from our database um, as best we can. We also have a conference proceeding index and a book um, index, which we were searching in there. This final index, which we now consider to be part of our, our core collection, is what I think Rhonda might be referring to in her um, tell us what's covered in our Indigenous database. It's not an Indigenous database, it's what we call Emerging Sources Citation Index. The only criteria we have relaxed for journals here is that they don't necessarily have an international citation pattern when we look at who's citing the articles published in the journal. And that makes a lot of sense for a lot of categories, one of them being education. If you're publishing in Australian education journals or Australian law journals or Australian uh, economics journals potentially, the world isn't interested in that necessarily because our syllabuses are very different to international syllabus. The same as law, people publishing in Japanese law, we're not citing here because we're not so interested in Japanese law necessarily. So by the nature of some research in areas, they are not necessarily of international interest and so some of these journals aren't necessarily garnering international citation patterns but they are very impactful journals and have a very, very strong citation pattern in which case they'll be selected in here. Another thing for that index could be said Indigenous studies. So if I'm publishing in Maori studies in New Zealand, that content isn't necessarily being cited internationally, same as um, Indigenous studies here and others overseas. Since we relax that criteria, so in here we have about 13 and a half thousand journals that we index cover to cover. Everything that is published in those journals will be in our database. In emerging sources with that one criteria relaxed, there's now just over 7,000 journals being selected in that index and so that content will be available in here. And education, there'll be a lot of education content in there 
Um, I think the biggest areas of research are in, in the emerging sources are education, law, economics, business, those sort of things, management. So that's what that is, yes? Um, with the relaxation, um, how has that changed the percentile metrics? Yeah, really, really good question. Really good question. So when you say percentile mes metrics, you mean? Top 10 percentile journals, top 5 percentile journals. Yeah, good question. So that's actually one of the questions in here as well. I think that might be one of yours, Herb. So I'll, I'll answer that now. So when you're talking about percentile of journals, you're looking at a journal in a category and you're ordering them by impact factor, which is something that we commonly do as well, I imagine. So the best place for that content is actually across the top here, is in journal citation reports. So this is everything that is in our science citation and social sciences index, which are those first two. The emerging sources citation index, none of the journals indexed in there actually have yet been included in journal citation reports and so won't be given a percentile. They don't have impact factors calculated on them as yet. We have found that the emerging sources is a great way for journals to kind of shift into, so into the, the main collection. So last year we had 250 odd journals which were accepted into emerging sources a couple of years before that move into the core collection because all of a sudden they were being cited internationally. Obviously probably because they're being found more readily internationally. Um, but basically we as a company don't calculate percentiles on the emerging sources citation index so it hasn't affected our percentile calculations at all, if that makes sense. If I quickly touch on the, sorry Herb, did you want to go? Um, it may be tangential, but uh, one of the things that we're, uh, we have no idea what's going to happen is what journals are going to be included in the era. Uh, as a, because obviously the journals that you index uh, are, not, uh, are, are a smaller subset of what was considered previously an era. And has the government decided what they're going to do with all those in, uh, journals that you don't Yeah, include? Yeah, well, we're, I had a long conversation with the ARC about this yesterday. So yes, uh, um, let me loop back to that. Um, first, let's talk about what we cover. And then, okay. so I, I will spend two minutes on journal percentiles, if that's okay, because I think it is a question here that I've been asked here. So if you click on journal citation reports, you guys have access to all this data as well, as long as you're um, on campus or you're logged in, I encourage you to create a sign in for all these um, kind of platforms across here you'll have access to remotely. If you create a sign in, you can sign into these remotely for a, a few months before it asks you to go back to your institution and, and log in just um, to ensure that you're still there. If I wanted to browse by category, you can obviously type in a journal name and, and pull up a certain journal if you like. These are our categories. We have 254 Web of Science categories. You'll find that they're very similar to kind of FOR code categorizations. The ARC is currently reviewing its FOR code system, which is why your question is actually more difficult to answer than um, currently stands. So um, we work closely with the ARC to create um, these categorizations as well as their, their FOR code categorizations so that they can benchmark research across Australia. We do this globally. In economics, it's our biggest category with regards to the number of journals. I've just ordered by the number of journals in here. Economics, we map. 353 journals to the category of economics. Yes? So you don't have uh, like a hierarchical system, do you? So like you wouldn't have medicine and then subcategories underneath medicine? We do. We have what is our essential science indicator categorization system, which is 22 categories, which are big, broad things like medicine, physics, chemistry, okay. business and economics. And then we have a trickled down into what is Web of Science category system, which is where all of our journal kind of metrics are calculated at, the level that they're all calculated at. Can you get rankings and so on at that upper level? Yes, yes, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, uh, at, at these levels, like I said, there's 254 categories here and you can click on here. So if we scroll down and we look for something that may be relevant to you guys like, um, well, let's, let's order it alphabetically and look for psychology. Uh, so we have psychology educational in there, which is um, mapped to our social sciences citation index. We also have a number of psychology fields with journals in them that are mapped to our science citation index. So do note that they're two different indexes. Everything in either of those two indexes though will get um, an impact factor 
and so will appear in here. If I click on this one, you can get an overview of the whole category. So you can get averages across the whole category. If I click on that, I'm getting all the data. So this is how many journals have been mapped to this each year. This last year where we've calculated there's 59. The median impact factor is 1.4. The aggregated impact factor, if I consider all documents in all those journals, is 1.9. Um, the number of articles in there and so on and so forth. That's all the data you'll want on that specific category. If I go back, or I don't even need to go back, if I click on that 59, it will take me through to the list of journals, and you can now start to look at percentiles for your journals in that list, which haven't been interrupted by our emerging sources citation index. Um, so the top journal in here is Educational Psychology Review. By impact factor, I'm just ordering by impact factor here. You can do this and customise the indicators you're looking at on these journals if you like, and you'll get a list of them by impact factor. That's how we calculate our percentiles on journals. Within a category, we look at where the journal sits in that category. This one will have a percentile of 100, which is right at the top. And um, others, if I scroll down here, scroll across, I think I've got percentile in here. Yeah, average GIF percentile. So this will be ordered by percentile, obviously, because I'm ordering by impact factor. So last impact factor year, where ordering by that. Ah, sorry, not necessarily ordered because it's average GIF percentile. Some of these journals will be mapped to another category as well and they'll have a percentile in that category as well. That average GIF percentile is an average of their percentiles across the categories that they're mapped to. Does that make sense? A little bit, little bit difficult. This is cool as well. Um, this has actually changed pseudo recently. If you click on any one of these journals, I'm going to click on, does anyone want me to click on a specific journal here that they may have an interest in? Let's click on the first one. The view for a single journal is a little bit different in here and I think much more informative. And it, gives you, it starts to give you an idea into the area of bibliometrics. We find in academia, and a lot of people won't agree with me off the cuff here, but it definitely is the case when we're indexing things, a lot of bibliometric activity falls in a very, very small portion of journals. So the ARC has 20 something thousand journals which they want to look at for their um, Australian review. When they look at it, we covered up to, I think it was 16,000 for them and gave them data on 16,000. They found that 90% of the activity was occurring in a very, very small portion of those journals. Okay, 90% of what they were actually looking at and wanting to calculate was, was occurring in, um, yeah, what was a, a third of those journals. So 33% um, of those journals. And this can be said for all bibliometric activity in any single journal in any sort of area of research. You'll find that very few papers get cited a lot and a lot of papers don't get cited very often at all. And so every single journal will have what is a like a decaying exponential there when you look at that sort of view. And that can be said for all literature everywhere. This is the impact factor of that journal across time. This is how its percentile in the categories that it's been mapped to has, has um, changed across time. Okay, so this journal has had a um, significant uplift in the last couple of years and is at the top of its category now. If it was mapped to other, uh, mapped to other journal categories here, those um, percentiles would be um, evident there. You can also get an idea of the publications that have made the biggest difference in the last <laughs> journal impact factor year. So this title has been um, cited 26 times in that one year. The impact factor is calculated based on one year of citations to content within the journal published over two years time. And so this journal, this, this uh, article is actually shifting this journal's impact factor significantly. It's those documents that get cited a lot that actually push things like impact factor out which is why percentiles is actually a good way to look at bibliometric activity because you take that ex exponential decay at a publication level or at a journal level and force it across 0 to 100 scale. Any questions about our journal content there and how we metric journals? One last question. Yes. So, uh, I, I know you need to jump on the Insights and I noticed the Insights has a three month delay between an article going on to ORCID ID and then being registered. Is that the same with Web of Science? Is there a three month, three month lag or is that Web of uh, basically uh, the same time as the ORCID? As soon as we get the data. So Web of Science updates daily. 
with new content, which is why you can get an alert sent to you daily because there's potentially more content every day that you might be interested in. So like I said, if you know, Herb's putting all those ORCID IDs, if he really wants, he can, he can have an update every day with new content that's falling under those ORCID IDs. So Web of Science updates every day with new content. Insights, a little bit more complex, and so updates every month with new content. And yes, the monthly update um, will be lagged as to where the content has been cut off. So the latest update was last weekend, and it will have clipped data at the end of December, I think. Everything in Web of Science up until the end of December. Something like that. It'll say at the bottom, I'll show you the timestamp. Does, does that include the API? Uh, the Insights API is feeding out numbers that you're seeing in the front end of Insights, so yes, exactly right. The time cited API, so the Web of Science API is feeding out daily updates. Um, and I think the throttle limit is something like 50,000 a day. Um, so you can get up to 50,000 updates a day there. Um, and Insights is doing that with every new update. So it's not worth throttle. So you, you update based upon uh, the printed version rather than the online version? Yeah, so this is a, a good question as well. So we have, um, we have this problem now with the, has anyone heard of Plan S? and all this sort of thing going on. Like, governments have stopped subscribing to Elsevier content and other big publishers. They've decided that Norway's done it, um, Sweden, I think, did it, uh, New Zealand's talking about doing it or done it, and they're just refusing to pay for published content anymore, and publishers are going to have to come to the party when it comes to providing open access. We have funding agencies as well. Um, a lot of government funding agencies, including our own, are wanting to push for everyone to be publishing in open access journals. Um, they want content to be open access. So this is changing what we're finding here. And you'll notice if I run that, uh, let's actually do a topic search. So this is searching for either of those words somewhere in the title abstract. It's not searching for the phrase because I didn't put a italic around it. Um, if I scroll down there, you'll find that 2,717 of those um, uh, items are open access and you can filter by that if you like. But if we go down and open up more filters, there's actually a lot of different types of open access material now. Some institutions are taking back uh, the rights on papers that have been produced out of their institution and putting them open access in institutional repositories and we're finding them. A lot of journals are promoting content in closed or uh, what, what is uh, uh, previously a paid for content um, and they're promoting that or bringing that out of behind paywalls for whatever reason. Um, that is being found by our tool as well, as well as stuff that's being published online before it's necessarily being published um, <coughs> in a journal, which would be considered open access. So this is green open access and green accepted means it's somewhere online. It has gone through the peer review process. It has been and accepted into a journal. It's just not necessarily come out into a hard copy yet. Together. Eventually they all come together, but there's 250 odd documents there that have been accepted but not necessarily, and they're open access, but they're not necessarily yet being published into a journal. Yeah, well, they'd still, you'd still get citation metrics on these papers in there. Um, they just move from accepted into published once they become a, uh, become a hard copy journal content. So this, this is a really very interesting for publishers at least. We're not a publisher, we're an indexer, so we kind of get to sit back and watch this play out. Um, we do have a very strong collaboration with a company called Impact Story, which produces a tool called Unpaywall, which finds all this content and, and enables this open access content. We also recently acquired something called Copernio. I'm gonna take a very small tangent, only because from an academic's point of view, this is my favorite tool ever. Um, it, it's uh, something that enables you to find uh, the full text copy of a publication with one click, which I really, really like. Does anyone have that problem where they can't find the full text <laughs> of something that you want to read? I, yeah. 
I used to hate this. If you do have that problem, I fully encourage you to download, if you use Google Chrome or Firefox, whoops, sorry. Put it down to a, um, so the two guys that developed this tool actually now work for us. We acquired this tool and they um, um, work for our company, which is really cool. If I add this, is this to Chrome, this links into, it recognizes that you're um, searching for academic content. And if you're on a publisher's website, if you're on Web of Science, if you're on um, Google Scholar, if you're on any of those things where you're clearly looking for academic content, it will pop up with a little link anytime it can find based on Impact Stories open access tool. So everything we're able to find on the net freely available, as well as you can log into this under ACU subscriptions, if it can find the content that you're looking for, it will allow you to click on that content. Um, and what it will do is if I click on something here, a little um, green logo will pop up in the corner here. Same as if I'm on a publisher's website or anything like that. I'm obviously not logged in here. I still use my University, uh, University Sydney affiliation to log into this thing. So I love it. I get access to everything University of Sydney has access to from wherever I am. Um, and yeah, if, if you're logged in there, you can click on that and it will just take you straight through to the PDF. It also saves it in, you've got a locker up here. So everything you've clicked on and not been able to read immediately, which is almost always the case as well, it stores in your locker up here. Um, up to, I don't know, I need to sign in for the locker to be available. It's a little link in the app. I can click on the locker and it will show me all the documents that I've um, recently clicked on using the Capernaum app. Fully encourage you to download it. Not a sales pitch, it's a free app. <laughs> One more question. Uh, so more common in some fields is the use of pick application services like Open Science Foundation or Arbex or whatever. If something sits on there and gets citations and then it moves through to publication, does Web Science pick those? citations up yeah. or does it exclude them? No, it picks those up as well, so long as the citations are coming from journal content that we're indexing as well. So we're only picking up citations between journal content that we're indexing. But yes, it will pick those up. Good. Let's go get, get into some serious bibliometrics. Any questions about any of that so far? Can I just ask, if the journal doesn't have a hard copy form, then how do you get the citation? We still pull data from those journals. And obviously, we'll still pull information from other articles that cite those, that content. So a journal doesn't, most journals don't have hard copies anymore. <laughs> I'm wondering why you, the emphasis was on the hard copy, you're waiting for it to be. Oh, yeah, sorry. So those green accepted open access yes. there, they're in journals generally that are hard copy journals that have been published online first. Most people are finding their content online now, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so those, those green accepted though um, are have been accepted, just haven't yet formally been given a volume, an issue number, any of that sort of stuff. And actually most journal contents where a volume and an issue number and all that sort of stuff, there is no hard copy either. Yeah. It's just given a volume and an issue number. So we're waiting for that process to occur for those green accepted. So sorry, that's what I mean by hard copy. It's actually now not a hard copy. It's being given a volume issue number and page number. And a lot of content is waiting for that to occur, which has been accepted through all other peer review processes and editorial processes. Good question. Journal landscape's changing though, I think. Very, very interesting and Plan S is something that's being looked at internationally and how the world will change if everything is forced to be open access and publishers have to um, provide everything open access if basically we switched off all subscriptions to all journals and, and see how the publishers deal with that. That's what Plan S is looking at. Um, good. Insights. Uh, those are two journal citation reports. This is Insights. So this is the second link across the top here. Okay. One thing uh, I, I will loop back to and correct me if I'm wrong here because this is what goes on here so I don't really understand. But one thing you used to do in SciVal when you had access to SciVal is you used to get a benchmark across the globe in an FOR code that you were producing material in across the globe, across Australia, across the institution. Is that right? Am, am I understanding this correctly? To an extent, yes. Uh, we do lots of different things and I, I don't think that there's a standard. Okay, okay. Let me start with that. So if you're talking about 
1701, which is a psychology FOR code, and you wanted to look at everything that was being produced at, the, at ACU in 1701 and how that looks and compare that to Australia and compare that to internationally in those FOR codes and then potentially compare your own outputs as well just to get that comparison. Let's do that as the first example that I'm going to do in here. Before I click in, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview. Our, our bibliometric tool here, you, you, before you jump into any of these explorers, you actually have to ask of the platform, what question am I asking? So am I wanting to look at the research areas that I produce material in and how I perform in those research areas? If that's the case, I'm not looking at people, I'm looking at a research area comparison. I'm simply filtering by my outputs though. If I want to look at all the universities in Australia that are producing material in 1701 and which one's performing the best, say we, we want to shift on and, and get a job at the best Australian university in 1701, I'm comparing organisations, in which case I want to jump into the organisational explorer. So think about what you're asking of the platform before you jump into any one of these six explorers. If you do jump into any of these explorers, what you're going to get is a list of everything. So here we have, I've just jumped into the Organisational Explorer because I'm going to do that um, ACU example. I've got a list of organisations globally, um, currently ordered by total number of citations. Uh, a visualisation window, so actually let's break this thing down. There's, there's four sections to this. This is the visualisation window. Some of the visualisations and insights are really very good. Some of them are really crap. So make sure you're picking one of the very good ones. Um, here, underneath that, I have what I call the indicator bar. These are all indicators for research performance. At the moment, I only have four indicators here. I can change that by clicking on this cog next to name. If I click this cog, I can customise this bar. So what are some of the things you like to compare yourself with your institute with the country? Percentile or average percentile? Average normalised Sorry, average category normalised citation. So that's, that's already there, which is really very good. So that's the number of sites on average you're getting as normalised to the year and category that you're publishing in. I'm actually going to click on that and click, so they're the, the six that I'm looking at. If I click on browse indicators, oh, the mouse is a little bit jumpy. There we go. I can also look at kind of productivity metrics like percentage of documents in the top one or 10%. If you like, if you have more than 10% of your documents in the top 10%, you're obviously performing above average based on bibliometric indicators. Um, Just to cut in, um, is there a way of creating a top 5%? Like, are we able to create our own indicator? Uh, no. <laughs> you, you, you can look at that, and we will go into that. Sure. Um, I'll answer that. But no, that you're limited in each explorer to the indicators that are in here. Um, Impact, there'll be different ones there. Um, some that have already been added, some that are not there, um, haven't been added. If you wanted, you can add some of them. The collaboration metrics, if you want to look at how often you're collaborating with industry or internationally, you can add those things as well, okay? Um, basically click and click done, make sure you save that, and then underneath that table will look very different based on the metrics that you're, or the indicators that you're choosing there. This is your list of data. This is the t unfiltered currently. This is my unfiltered table of data. This is every institution globally as ordered by the total number of citations those institutions have, have acquired. And this is our filter bar which allows us to drill into that data to look at what we're really very interested in. Okay, so if I do want to look at um, California system, it's not really fair to be looking at systems because there's multiple universities rolled up. So if you want to get rid of academic systems, you can actually do that and say academic systems not equal to, and then you'll get all other institutions that aren't academic systems um, in that list. Okay, so the biggest university in the world is Harvard, obviously. No surprises there. If I just wanted to look at academic institutions, I could do that or academic and government institutions like CSIRO and all that sort of thing, you can do that. You can filter by that. Click on that, make that an equal sign, and I'm now only going to get universities and things like the US Department of Energy will be filtered out because it's a government entity, okay? Good. Location, I can say Australia if I like. And get Australia out, and then it makes it a little bit more relevant. So then we're only looking at Australian academic institutions as ordered by, if I wanted to order by total number of documents, I can click on that 
and that will order by total number of outputs rather than total number of citations received. Um, scrolling down further, we talked about refining into a research area. We want to look at where ACU is producing material in 1701. Did I say 1701? So we can do that. So research area, and this, like I said, research areas, there's different schemas. So um, in here we have Web of Science categories and our um, ESI categories, which I talked about, which are our much broader categories. So if I click on ESI, or Essential Science Indicators, there's going to be 22 big broad categories that we map journals to as a company. This will give you 254 categories that we map journals to as a company. If I click FOR level 1 or level 2, that's simply FOR 2 digit and 4 digit. Okay? So that's, and that's the Australian government's mapping system. They like to have their own mapping. And if I, if I do that and filter by that, I'm going to get everything produced in one or more. You can choose as many of these FOR codes as you like, um, as the Australian government considers it. So if you do want 1701, you can do that. And you can say psychology. You can also type in here, rather than clicking on it, if you want to be a little bit more savvy about it, you can type something in and you'll get, well, there's no 1703. I should know this. Just 1701. 1701's fine? Good. That's, that's how you do that though, right? And then we can filter by that and we can look at Australian universities and where they're producing material across time in, in that specific FOR code. Okay, good. I will say there's a caveat to this. Um, this is as the Australian government mapped them to the era round in 2015. The 2018 mapping of ERA isn't yet public. The ARC won't let us make it public yet. And because as soon as we map them in product um, to FOR codes as last ERA round went, it will become public. The ARC is not letting us yet do the new mapping. I will say that not very many journals shifted between FOR codes between 2015 and 2018. You may, you may know this better than I. Um, but that's what this is on, based on, okay? This is the journal mapping that the ARC used. We don't shift documents. I know you, universities like to shift documents between FOR codes for the ARC to look at. We don't do any of that. This is just at a journal level, okay? And when a journal is cross-classified uh, in different categories? Uh, that's every journal that's classified to 1701 despite how many FOR codes it's been categorised to. So if I do, for example, click on this, um, Let's see if we can, well, let's you actually... update the results in, to this. Yeah, so I have, I have, I have updated that. Oh, okay. And so that's new. Um, I'm just trying to find Catholic. I would have expected... Let's put... Let's search you guys out. So you can search out institutions. And if you're really interested in anything in your data list, you can actually take it, click on it, and pin it to the top, and then delete whatever's in your search here, and say... Now I have a list of everything and no matter how I'm ordering my data, ACU will be pinned to the top. You can do that with multiple institutions as well if you want to do that, okay? Um, if you want to make it a little bit more relevant with time period, our database in Insights goes all the way back to uh, uh, 1980, obviously. If I want to make that and say, look, I only want content from 2010 onwards, you can obviously filter by a specific year. And to loop back to the question that was over here earlier, the latest update here, if I scroll down, um, Insights data set was updated, well, 27th of February, so not last weekend, my apologies, but it includes all content that was indexed in Web of Science through to the 25th of January. Okay, so it, there's a couple of months lag there. Good. The other thing I'll say is, if you remember, I talked about the Emerging Sources Citation Index and that additional 7,000 journals worth of content. If you want that content to be included, you simply tick that box on. We have as a tick on, tick off box because institutions have been doing this sort of benchmarking for a long period of time and we only produced ESCI a few years ago. A lot of institutions didn't want to include all that additional content all of a sudden. They wanted to maintain their benchmarking in a, uh, in a, a kind of, um, what's the right word? Consistent manner. So that's going to include content from those 7,000 journals. You'll notice that the number of um, articles there hasn't jumped up all that much because it is, even though it's 7,000 journals, the number of articles in those journals isn't, it's not a large amount of content at an article level. Good. Okay, so far? Any questions so far? Does that seem pretty easy to use? Or am I going too fast? So the other day I, I tried to put into the 
um, research person, I can't find it now. Yep. Uh, a whole bunch of awkward ideas. And uh, I don't know if it was because of the spot or whatever, the or AC Wi Fi, but each time I tied it, it ground to a halt. And is there any tips to kind of fix performance? Fix performance. Uh, I, I, it just it wouldn't when I have five or six or five days in, it just would crack. So this, yeah. Yeah. So this filter, I should say, this little middle bit of the filter works a little bit differently, in that it doesn't operate as a filter, but it's rather looking at the collaborations outside of that. So if you're looking at a person here or multiple people, it's not going to filter by the organisations that that person has affiliated themselves with, but rather all the other organisations that that person has worked with on those documents. We'll talk, I think it's a little bit more advanced. Um, we will talk about it in a second. But if I wanted to look at, for example, the Australian organisations, I think this is a question on here as well, so I'm going to cover it off. If I wanted to look at the Australian academic organisations that ACU has worked with in 1701, I can, I can say, Australian Catholic University here, update those results. ACU's falling off that list. ACU doesn't collaborate with ACU the way that we define it in here. ACU collaborates with other organisations, in which case ACU's not on their list, but ACU does fall on all these documents. So on 145 documents in 1701, since 2010, ACU has worked with someone at University of Melbourne. Does that make sense? And actually, you can now look at which um, collaborations are having the, the biggest impact with regards to CNCI or you know how often you're collaborating internationally then with uh, with these Australian organizations if you like things like that if you want okay I'm gonna get rid of that and go back a step just because I want to produce something for you if I want to break that down and get benchmarks for these um, things, if I baseline for the country or region for all pinned items, that's obviously going to give me an Australian baseline for everything in Australia in 1701 since 2010. Still within my filters, but it's an Australian baseline, okay? If I add a benchmark and baseline for globe, that's going to be everything published in 1701 across the globe. So now I think I'm getting close to what we talked about at the start of the analysis before I started anything. That's GLOBE, that's Australia, that's ACU. And if I extract this data, if this is something that you do benchmark yourself again or use this data regularly, you can extract this data. Um, there's 40 items left. So there's 40 Australian universities that have produced material in 1701 since 2010. If I export that, I'm going to get that list. Um, if I export it with the trend data clicked on, I'm going to get the list broken down per year. So I'm going to get 2010, 2011, 2012, so on and so forth. Okay, I'll, I'll actually do that just to show an example. And then you can visualize that however you like. It's going to look exactly like the table of data that you've produced there. Yeah? So that's everything. There's your baselines and there's your list. ACU falls at the top because I pinned it to the top. It's ranked 18th by a number of documents in there. Um, and then you can, you can do whatever you like with that. Is that, is that good? Does that answer uh, good? If you did want to look at just a person there and you did just want to filter by a single person or multiple IDs and get a person's output in 1701, I actually prefer, are you looking at yourself? Are you looking at the whole department? What are you guys doing? You, you, do, you do both? So I actually like to do that in the research area. So I get a breakdown of all the research areas and then if I construct a baseline I can see everything but I can then also break it down by research area fairly easily. So that's um, Australia in 1701, right? If I added other FOR codes, one thing I will point out here as well is that this timestamp, the bottom of every Excel spreadsheet you, fill, you, you kind of uh, export out of here, you're going to get the exact filters that you had on at that point in time, okay? 
because um, it will change. This data is dynamic. The number of documents will change. Um, the CNCIs, if documents are getting cited or vice versa, not getting cited, the CNCIs will go up or down respectively, obviously, compared to global content. So all these numbers will change constantly. And so this timestamp is very important. We do get emails a lot of the time saying, oh, the CNCI is different. I did this a few weeks ago. It will obviously be different because the metrics are changing. It's dynamic data. Good. Let's do the example of an, an ORCID ID. So let's actually look at a person or multiple people. If I jump into research areas, I'm going to just use this as an example because it's a different, uh, a different explorer. I'm actually looking at everything now as mapped to Web of Science categories. If I, again, if I'm in my filter bar, you'll notice that this is a little bit different in that this is now not allowing me to filter by certain locations or, or uh, organisational type, but rather it allows the attributes of my data here. I'm now choosing research areas or schema. That's because I'm in the research area explorer and I'm um, able to change the attributes of my data by schema. I can change that to FOR level one or level two. And we're now looking at the outputs across the globe in as mapped to the four digit FOR codes. If I do want to use and look at a person, um, I can do that. And you can actually do this for anyone who has a public ORCID ID. And again, for a group, if you have a list of ORCID IDs, I, I don't ever like using um, ORCID IDs <laughs> in this sense um, from a, a list that I've been sent for, from people in the room because sometimes people are a bit touchy about having all their metrics kind of sitting up there in front of the screen. But for point of demonstration, I'll happily embarrass myself. Um, you can throw one or, or multiple ORCID IDs in there and, and like you, you could throw that list in there that I produced out of that Excel spreadsheet and you're now getting a breakdown of the documents across FOR codes that I've produced and how I'm going compared to uh, uh, global ba benchmarks and baselines. Again, if you're not happy with just these metrics and you want to look at other things, you can click on that cog and add a, a number of indicators to kind of compare yourself to what we just produced on ACU or, or what have you. I don't think I've got anything in 1701, but if I wanted to compare myself in 1701 to ACU or, or Australia, I'd simply be comparing those metrics to the, the data that I just forced out or export it out. Is that okay? Is that good? If you want a baseline of the whole data set there, obviously benchmarks and baselines for all items in here will give me everything that has been produced by me or that's attached to that ORCID ID. Do note that this won't be necessarily everything produced by the person, but everything that is in their ORCID ID. So if you're not adding documents to your ORCID ID, they won't be filtering out here, okay? It also does take the lag. So if you add it to your ORCID ID today, don't expect to see those documents in here today. It's a monthly update, so it will take a number of weeks before that data is, is available in here. So if I encourage you all to update your ORCID IDs today so that in a month's time you can kind of uh, get all these metrics out. Any questions about that? And so I don't know, to, to your performance, I, I, I actually don't know what problem you had exactly, but I mean, I should be able to add as many ORCID IDs to this and, and look at a group. I, I haven't reached a limit here and update those results, and now I'm looking at myself in addition to a number of other people. Sorry? Yeah? So. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, so I, this is now looking at the number, so there's a multitude of research areas that these people are producing material in and in my visualization window as I add um, entities to my visualization I'm just adding um, research areas that I'm actually lo looking at there. Um, again I'm not a big fan of the tree map, the bar graph, I can look at the bar graph and this is the total number of citations that these documents have received across those. If I want to look at a different metric I can change that and look at my my group's category normalised citation impacts here across these different areas that we're producing material in. Um, I will say for this as well, you'll notice that there was only four indicators that I could choose from there. 
that's limited to whatever I have in my data set here. So if I want to actually visualize other things like what percentage of time am I collaborating internationally in here, I actually have to take that cog, browse those indicators, look at international collaborations, add it to that data set, say done, and then I can change that up here and international collaborations is a, is a metric or an indicator that I can view. Does that make sense as well? I, yeah, if, maybe we can sit down and look at the problem that you... Yeah, cool. Oh, yes. Yeah, that, that's a very good point as well. So here, I don't like the functionality in this respect so much. I have raised this with product, but it turns out it's much more difficult than I want it to be. But you can't just copy a list of ORCID IDs in here like you can into Web of Science. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but um, you need to kind of add them one by one. To that point though, if I did want to look at a list of ORCID IDs and their outputs, and I created a data set around that, I can do and create custom data sets out of insights, or sorry, out of Web of Science and move them into my insights. You do need to create a login for this. So you'll notice that I'm logged in here. You need to register for Web of Science and Insights to do this. But let's say, where, where were we with that? Let's go back to my search history and produce that. So this was all your ORCID IDs. Do you mind me using this set? And if we save that to Insights, we actually have a custom data set for all those ORCID IDs. Yeah, so this, this is, and you can do this for any set that's up to 50,000 documents. So if you're doing a topic analysis and you want to do something on that, you can, you can do that. Again, your search string is, you're only limited to the imagination of your search string here. Um, so if I wanted to do that, you can say this is IPPE, outputs, and I can save that across. You can have up to 20 data sets, custom data sets saved onto each user as well. I have my own custom data sets. Um, you'll have your own custom data sets. Each user can have up to 20 and each of those data sets can be up to 50,000 big. If we hit done, I'll now be sent an email which will tell me you've saved um, 1,280 documents across to Insights in a data set. Maybe a few of them have dropped off the list simply because they were published in the last couple of months. So that in that email, it will detail the documents that have not been included in that data set. Also, Herb's articles from 1968 won't be included either because the data in Insights only goes back to 1980, sorry. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, now that data set will appear as, as a custom data set. So if I wanted to see the regions that were appearing on that list, I can do that. So that's your 12, 1200 odd documents. I'm going to just jump into a different explorer because I haven't yet ex uh, explored them all, if, if you like. If I jump into regions, my data set up here is customizable. So you'll notice here, I did a, a recent report on climate change and refugia. Refugia. Um, I've done an open access report for New Zealand recently, so these are my custom data sets. I've also got a number that I've produced for you guys here, and this is based on your ORCID ID, so that IPP outputs. If I click on that, I've now got a list of those outputs as ordered by the total number of documents, the countries that are appearing on those documents, yeah? So Australia actually doesn't appear on all of them by the looks of things. So people have produced stuff overseas and then moved over by the looks of things. Sorry? Yes. So these numbers are still calculated across the category and 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 these actually these category normalized citation impacts are calculated across the category schema that you set your schema to. So I currently have this schema set to Web of Science category. What this is doing is calculating across Web of Science schema. So this actually lo links back to the top 5% question. Let's say I wanted to look at these documents particularly. This is very, very good by the way, guys. Congratulations. Very good. So this, if I wanted to look at 
those documents, break those documents down and look at where they sit at a document level. I'll just go back a step here. All these numbers are always links. So you can click through and break that, granulate that down to a document level. So if I did want to look at the number of documents here that was in the top five percentile, as, as I was looking at, of those 736, I'll scroll across my percentile in subject area. I can order it by percentile in subject area. Not, I don't want to go 100, so in this case, zero is, is top. I can scroll down there, and actually the top 10 are well in two, um, and we might actually view well, we can even export this at a document level. So we can export this and export and look at the 736 documents and then say, as ordered by percentile, however many of them have a percentile that's less than five and then calculate a percentage. So you can calculate that, it's just a little bit roundabout. Is that okay? Back to, back to the schema um, kind of that question. This document's category normalized citation impact is 356. It's been cited 356 times more than the average document based on this research area and this year that it was published in. So if I look at every document published in Medicine General, Internal, Public, Environmental and Occupational Health, in 2015, take all those documents, there'll be thousands of documents globally produced in that category in that year, and then I look at an average number of citations that those documents have received, the average is six or seven. This particular document has been cited 2,428 times, in which case it's been cited 356 times more than the average document. Does that make sense? So that's, that category normalised citation impact is very, very high. Any questions about that at a document level? If I change that to FOR code, if I change my schema to FOR code, that document's category normalised citation impact would change because I'm then calculating it across. So I'm going to change my research area schema to FOR level 2, update those results click on Australia, you'll notice that the number of documents has changed as well because the Australian government doesn't consider a lot of the content that we index. So this is only content now that the Australian government's considering. On those 541, I'm going to assume that Lancet document's still at the top, which it is. The CNCI is now calculated across that FOR code, so it's actually dropped by 100 because we're now looking at a different sort of mapping. Any questions about that? I like to think that maths is very simple, but a lot of people don't see it the same way. Does anyone want me to take you through any of these, how these indicators are calculated? Yeah, can you just clarify for me um, the citation counts? So if we're examining the publication comes out in 2016, the citation, if, I were, if it were to be cited in 2019, is that still counting? Yes. So it's, all, it's a continuous thing. It's yes. So this document has been cited two and a half thousand times yeah. since 2015. You expect documents, and actually, if we have a look at an example. take a long time. Yes, yes. And, and newer documents generally have much lower expected number of citations. This one, published in Public Health in 2015, is expected to have received 10 citations. On average, documents published in public health in 2015 has received 10 citations. Papers published in 1988 in these categories, on average, have received 45 citations because they've had a lot longer to accrue citations. Normally, you would actually expect papers published in 1701, 1702 to probably have received less citations than, than 1117. But in this case, because this is a much older document, so these normalizations are running across category, year of publication, and the type of publication as well. So whether it's a review or an article or a conference proceeding. Any questions? One of the things that is a bit hard is within the insights, it seems you can only like, search by orchid ID or research ID. Um, so if, mm -hmm. if some of us were naughty and didn't keep our orchid ID up to date, but we wanted to include them. Is the best way to do it through Web of Science and then transfer it in? Yeah, uh, yeah. So you want to keep, sorry, say that again, you want to so keep your ORCID so ID. 90% of us have ORCID IDs, but 10% yeah. of us 
haven't, but we want to have the whole hundred percent. Yep. The best way would be to do a search on Orchid ID and these additional people in Web of Science. And yes. Okay. Transfer do a data set transfer into Web of Science, like I've oh, into Insights, like I just did. Yeah. You can also search your name out and the institutions that you've worked at in Web of Science. So you can search out, for myself, I could search out A. Donna at University of Sydney or Imperial College because they're the institutions that I've worked for and affiliated myself with, pull out my publications, save a BibTeX file out of that, like export a BibTeX file out. You can do that for any set of publications out of here. I don't have to save to Insights. I can save to other file formats into a BibTeX file and upload that directly into ORCID. So it really does take three minutes to update your ORCID ID. So there's no integration across Web of Science to your ORCID ID? No. Like you, pull in publications? you can't pull in publications to Web of Science, no. You can... The other, the other way. Yeah, so you can save a BibTeX file out or you can save to... And this has actually changed. You can save to your researcher ID or your Publons ID. Has anyone, been, has anyone used Publons? Yeah. So Publons is changing as well. I'll just quickly, Publons, Researcher ID and Publons ID are actually merging. So the two things are becoming one because we, we own both of them and they're both just IDs that we ask academics to update and I understand as an academic that's annoying. So it, Researcher ID, which is your publications, and Publons ID, which is your review and editorial activity, have recently merged. And now if I click on... Um, Just to throw a spanner. Yes. What happens if you have two researcher IDs? Oh, you, you are the bane of our existence. That's what you are. Obviously, you can, you can merge. Yeah, so you, you, you should actually just send me an email and ask me to delete one of your researcher IDs and then keep your other one up to date. Um, that's how you should do it. Um, if you click on anyone now in Publons ID, you'll actually find that their research activity is already in here. And I, this week, actually, um, Professor Jonathan Adams, who is the guy who developed ISI, which is the Institute for Scientific Information, which was the company that was bought by Thomson Reuters that produced these databases. He's moved back to our company recently and he's out in Australia at the moment. He's in Melbourne today. We were in Canberra with him yesterday and he's actually shown off some of the visualisations that are coming in here and they're really very cool to get an idea of your breakdown to, to kind of produce a really nice CV, I guess, for an academic. Um, is, is it okay if I click on Stephen? Steve? Does anyone know Steve Simpson? Actually, he might not be the best example simply because he hasn't been in here to throw a photo in or updated his own profile. But you've got his peer review activity in here um, and you'll also have his... If he has um, a researcher ID, you'll also have his... He's a bad example. Let's, let's pull up someone better. Phil's is up to date. Phil's is up to date? Phil Parker. Is it okay if I use Phil? Is Phil in the room? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. So let's fill it by that. Philip Parker? Where's the picture? Yeah, you haven't thrown a picture in here. <laughs> so, so you're all... <laughs> you're, So that's reviews. I still, uh, I'm not yet seeing this. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm promising things that haven't yet happened entirely. This maybe hasn't yet changed, but it is changing. And you will, uh, let, me, let me see if I can do this. I'm sure I've seen this. Yeah, so for some who we've already meshed, um, there will be publication data as well as review data in the same place. And not yet have all the visualizations popped in, 
but a lot of them in the not too distant future will be um, kind of really nice to show off your publication and review activity in the one place. Um, and there's this really very nice one which I like called a beam plot, which will be coming about in the, in the coming months that um, uh, I guess Professor Jonathan Adams and his team. So Jonathan Adams has come back to Clarivate to produce what is ISI again. So the Institute of Scientific In Information is back, but it's not a company. It's it's an academic group centred at uh, in within our business, and they basically just do cool stuff bibliometrically, and we then take that cool stuff and integrate it with our platforms. Um, and the first few things uh, will be will be thrown in here. Um, as we're looking to produce a, a, a single ID where you can keep your editorial review and publication activity. Orchid Idea unfortunately isn't owned by us. It's not. Um, it's an entity that's separate to us, but we do strip data out of there every um, few weeks, which we then index. <coughs> Good. I'm conscious I only have 15 minutes left. I do have a hard stop, unfortunately, at 1.30. I might, I think I've covered off most things in here. One, one, five and ten percent, I think I answered that. How to get out percentage of documents in the top one and ten percent is easy, five a little bit more convoluted. Um, broken down by year, I didn't show you that straight away. So in, in insights here, I'm, I'm looking at the whole group uh, just as an example. You can obviously filter by a single person if you like. This. Um, uh, this benchmark, I can look at all the documents in this group as per my filter. So a baseline for all items will produce baseline for all the items in here as will a global benchmark if I like. If I want this data broken down by year, so I, I look at all documents in 2015 separately to 2016 separately to 2017, I can just click that trend data and export that and you'll notice that when that CSV comes out, it's actually now data as broken down by year. If that makes sense. And you so you've graph got it by year as well. Sorry. And you can you graph it by year as well? Uh, yes. So in your visualization window, rather than looking at a bar graph, you can look at a trend graph and look at the total number of publications. That's time cited. I might go total number of documents and just look at the top one. So this is the number of documents that this group is producing across time each year. If you wanted to look at the regions that are contributing to that, I could add regions to this because I'm in the regional explorer. So yes, you can graph trend graph, uh, trend data. I find impact data becomes a little bit noisy. So if I wanted to look at CNCI, um, be very careful when you're using this. You know, there was one really good document published in the year 2000 by someone within the group, right? And that's why that CNCI has jumped up significantly. There's also been a, a paper in, in 1985 and a paper in 2015. If you start to try to run comparisons with CNCI, because each year I'm probably only looking at five to ten documents, all it takes is one document to have a CNCI like the one we looked at, which has one of 250, and that average across those documents is ridiculous and meaningless. You need to be really very careful when using the CNCI as it is an average. If I use other things like percentage of documents in the top 10%, I might be smoothing. I don't have that. It's a good example because I don't have that yet in my table. So if I want to look at um, productivity and add documents in the top 1 or 10% and then I want to view that in my in my window, you might get something which is a little bit less noisy simply because I'm not looking at an average across documents anymore, but I'm looking at how many documents actually sit in that top 10 percentile. I really like the use of percentile when we're talking bibliometrically because of that reason that I, I mentioned earlier. Our distributions are always decaying exponentials, and so you want to kind of span that out across a scale that um, is reasonable to look at. So, so that is one way to smooth that data, I guess. Um, you can obviously, so when this group works in Australia, 36% of the documents are in the top 10%. The USA is a good collaborator or, or there's been a lot of good content that's come out of the USA and so on and so forth as you go down. Um, you can start to see the regions of the world. If we wanted to break that down by institutions, we obviously take that same data set, this data set here, and I jump into the institutional explorer and break it down by institutions. Yeah. Good. Ay, 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 ay. 
listing of international collaborations. If I want to look at one, one last thing before I open it up to questions, how, which explorer would I jump into if I wanted to look at the regions of the world that I've collaborated with and how they're performing? I want to answer the question that is, which countries have I collaborated with and how, how are those collaborations performing? <coughs> Yeah, cool. So I'm going to jump into the Regional Explorer because I want a list of countries across the globe. Okay. Trap for young players as well. If I'm in a data set here, I'm filtered down to just those 1,200 odd documents that I saved across. No matter what Explorer I jump across here, it will remain in that data set unless I choose otherwise. In everyone's Insights user, you will have the Insights data set, which is the whole data set, which then allows you to filter down by the filters that are allowed in here. Um, your user will have the, your own data sets that you've produced material in here as well. I can click on Insights data set and go back to what is the entire globe here. And if I wanted to look at how my own personal collaborations with other, um, with other regions are performing, I can filter by a unique ID throw that in and these are now the countries that I've worked with and how those how those collaborations are performing so when the, you created that unique data set does that get updated or do you have to update it yeah good question no it doesn't so I've searched ORCID IDs out that's going to take a static set of documents and move them into insights if you want to do that analysis again in a month you have to run that search in web of science again and save it across yeah good question Herb Um, good. Any questions? I'm going to open it up because I think I have covered off most things there. Is there anything that other people are doing for promotional applications or job applications if you're looking to shift out of here or <laughs> <laughs> maybe you don't want to divulge that or, or grant applications I should say or is there anything people are doing a lot that they'd like to see me talk through here? Do you have any suggestions for good jobs to apply for? <laughs> <laughs> we have a solution consultant position in the area of life sciences open if anyone's interested in the corporate landscape. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's, it's not flashy. <laughs> Elsevier, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they have their own one. Is there any way to just pull that record across to public? No. Really yeah, so these, the story goes something like this. It's a sad story of two lonely guys out of New Zealand who um, both moved to university. One went into physics academia, one did a degree in history and so couldn't find a job afterwards. Um, went into whatever industry they went into. Best mates, grew up together, came up with this wonderful idea which was publons, which was capturing where people are reviewing. Basically, you will know as academics that you don't get any credit for editorial or, or peer review activity in any sense. You just do it out of the goodness of your little heart. And so they thought it would be great if we could construct a database and so they started to go to publishers to see whether they could strip this data out and obviously publishers have this data so they started collecting it and they went to Elsevier said the same thing you know we want to design this thing called Publons um, and we have started and it's really great this is it can we kind of look at your data and Elsevier said yeah this looks like a great idea fantastic a few months later Elsevier had their own platform which was uh, a Publons ripoff um, the two guys uh, who are wonderful guys Daniel and um, Andrew uh, have uh, recently shifted over to our company and so work for us, one of them in the Wellington office and one of them in the London office um, because we acquired Publons a number of years ago. There's no linkage between those two things because essentially one is a competitor to the other. Yeah, so unfortunately no. But I'll tell Andrew and Daniel's story because they would have liked me to tell the, told that story because that's exactly what happened. Um, yes, so you can forward emails. So one way of updating your Publons profile is by forwarding emails where you've been thanked for peer review. Um, the other one now is a lot of publishers are asking for your Publons ID when you're reviewing and so that data will be captured automatically. There's two ways that that data is captured. If you've said no every time that comes up, <laughs> so, no, so if you, it, when you're asked for your Publons ID and you said no, I don't want to give it, yeah. that data won't then be input into any Publons ID. Okay,
Any other questions about this data at all or uses of this data or anything you might like to see? Yes? If the order is not updated for a researcher, will the name search, name variant search, produce the outputs? Yeah. So um, if I did want to go into any of these and try to filter out, um, unfortunately for myself, there's other A donors across the globe producing material in actually very similar areas of research. There's, particularly in the southern European areas, um, Italy and Greece has some <laughs> A, A donors that are producing research. So if you filter A donor out in here, um, not so well. Uh, you won't get, and I can, I can actually show you this. Um, It's, it's not always the researcher's fault. Uh, sorry, one thing I should say as well, everything that has a blue dot here has a filter on it, obviously. If you want to clear everything that you've done, just click on clear filters on the filter window. So if I do want to filter by a person in here, actually not the best one to do. Let's do the research areas example, but rather than using an ID, use a um, name. So again, the same idea, clear filters, and it will take me back to exactly the start. Each explorer will remain the way you left it within your user. So note that as well. If you've been running an analysis in there, note that that will remain the way you've left it. Um, if I take person name and I type in Donna A here, you're not going to get a unique set of publications that are me um, because I don't have a unique name. Um, a Donna, that could also be me. A C Donna could be me. Um, Anthony C. Donna, Anthony Donna, and I generally liked the idea of putting my name on publications exact, in exactly the same format, but then journals take that away and format that however they format that, and so my name appears in many different ways, as all of yours likely will. Um, if you have a super unique last name, then this will work really well, <laughs> otherwise, no, um, not so well. I think what you'll find here is, yeah, they're, they're not all mine unfortunately. So ORCID ID is the best way to do that. A layman question. When, when do you use web of science and when in science? Most of them look like metrics. Yeah, good question. So Web of Science is our basic, it's more of a discovery tool. It's for the discovery of research and there is basic bibliometric outputs in there like number of citations or if you do a set you can kind of pull out you know, the total number of citations or h-index which is a, a bit of a useless metric as well. But yes, there's some basic, there's, a, there's some basic kind of indicators in here which are great bibliometric kind of outputs and also it's a really great way of tracking your research. If you wanted to look at you know, which institutes are citing our work the most, where should we be looking to extend to collaborate with, you can jump into one step forward, I can analyse those results and get some basic bibliometric. The power of this data is actually not necessarily in the indexing itself but it's in the connectivity of it. Um, so this will take out and look at institutions that are kind of citing work that's coming out of this group. So the University of College of London has cited this work 947 times. If you, any of you are, are shifting to London or going to visit London, you can view these records, break it down by author and look at the people who are reading and citing your work at the University of College of London, right? So I'm going to call this basic bibliometric output though. Nothing too advanced going on there. It's exploiting the connectivity though. Insights is doing the opposite to that. You'd be surprised how much further people want to go some of the time. Insights is doing what is much more advanced, intermediate to advanced bibliometric analysis. Um, and people want to go even further than that a lot of times. Insights gives you a set of 15 odd filters down the side which you can, you can use to filter. Um, a lot of people want to do a lot more than that. And we're indexing hundreds of things across each document. So. Um, yeah, there's, there's people analysing our raw data sets for various things as well. Um, but that's, I think that's the difference between Web of Science and Insights, if, if that's the question. Do we always regret the Web of Science to create the data set, or can data set be created in Insights? Yeah, data sets can be created directly in Insights as well. Um, so in Insights here, back out in just the home screen, in my folders, this is all the stuff that I've done. I haven't actually shown you how to produce your own reports in here yet, but you can create reports. I have an ACU folder in here where I've created um, you know, something last November when I was here with you guys by the, by the looks of things, um, which I haven't yet deleted. Um, in my folders though, back out into my folders, you'll also notice all these data sets that are my own. If I just want to get a document level breakdown of each of those, I can take this 
I can delete this data set if I want. I can export this data set and it will give me a document level breakdown of those 1200 odd documents as I, I want to look at it. I can also create a data set here. All you need to do that is a CSV file with down column A from cell one, DOIs, PubMed IDs or WAS UTs, which is our own number. It can be a mixture of those three and just copy them down and you can upload a data set directly into here. So I could have actually taken those DOIs from Stephanie McGlinchey's um, uh, CSV file, save it into its own CSV file just down in column A and then upload that directly. That's how you do that. Well, I know we agreed to let you go at 1.30. That's very nice of you. Outside. That's very nice Thank of you. you. very much. Oh, you, oh, you don't need to do that. Oh, that's, where you remember very, who we are. that's very and nice of you. Uh, I'm so, sure that we're going to be so, uh, calling upon you to give us some specialized help later on. Awesome. Thank so, you very no much. No problem. Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, I hope yeah. that was helpful for everyone. And like I say, it's actually really beneficial for me as well to, to give sessions here or come and help you guys out. So if there is anything that you see and there's demand for it, just let me know. Um, my email address is anthony.donna at claravate.com. Um, so you can even email uh, and we support that way as well. Thank you very much.